<laughs> filthy ones. Like. How many players are... Name five players on drugs. Um, <laughs> do, <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the James Lawrence All Court channel. Ben Foster's back again. Oh, anyway. Nightmare. 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 Just done the football fill-in, which is not this one. It's the other neon sign. But go and watch that if you haven't checked out Ben's channel. I mean, you're stupid. Um, well, what I'm going to do is not try and make you look stupid, but I thought, when I, if I've got a chance to chat to Ben Foster, what should I ask him? And I don't want to just ask him any, you know, the usual, who's the best player you play with, all this stuff. I want to ask you stuff that other players wouldn't say. And then I thought of the time. Other players wouldn't say? I'm no, nervous no, for so this. I'm nervous for this. Or professional players wouldn't say. Okay. So, because I think, understandably, when you're playing, there's certain things you can say and you can't say. Yeah. And you, you, there's places you'd go and you wouldn't go. Now that you're out of the game... You can say a bit more. Safe. Yeah, yeah, you can more. lift the lid a little bit. We can get some insight. Let's so some it. of these questions I think will make you a little bit uncomfortable, but hopefully you can go there because that is what Ben Foster brings to YouTube. All right, let's have it. Okay, so this has come from uh, Twitter and my uh, YouTube community page. So if you're not following me or subscribed, then you've missed out. Okay, first one from Stan. You seem a bit nervous. It's fine. Come you're going to be Stan, fine. Don't you know what you're talking me. about. Don't stitch me, Stan. So, and you, you've just got to answer... Answer as honestly as possible. <laughs> just answer it, all right. Uh, just ask, answer, answer, answer right. the question. <laughs> should footballers earn as much as they do? Yeah, unfortunately, they should. It's all um, it's all kind of relative to what it produces. So it's to do with the product and how much revenue it makes, and then basically, don't get me wrong, it's gross amounts of money. You know, at the top end of the game, it's gross amounts of money. But you've got to remember that it's a tiny fraction of football in general. Mm. Um, but it will always be that way because it is what it is. You know, there's like musicians out there, there's there's people, pop stars, all that kind of stuff that earn way much more than footballers, way much more. But again, it's all relative to what they bring in. So if the product is good and they're bringing in a lot of money, that's the way it goes. It just filters down. And I, there's so many more conversations you could have about people like in the NHS and firemen, policemen, all that kind of stuff, who without doubt, without doubt, should be earning a much higher wage, for sure. Everybody believes it. Well, I certainly believe that anyway. Um, but unfortunately for footballers, they will always be the easy target of somebody to sort of beat them with that stick of you earn too much money. I always find it hilarious as well. Like if someone goes, here's an amount of money, would you like that? And you go... Well, I've seen someone else has got a tiny bit more. Could I have that? And they go, yeah. yeah. You're going to take that like... You're, of course. It's just dumb not to take that money. Hey, so. if you work at Sainsbury's, yeah, and you're earning 20 quid an hour, and then Tesco come in for you <laughs> on 30 quid an hour, right? Taking that money. Yeah, Thank you very much, Tesco. Tesco's okay. finest, yeah? Okay, this is one from me. Um, how do players have a night out these days? You've got camera phones everywhere. People can take a picture like that, and it can go all over the world very quickly. How do, how do professional footballers today... Have a night out and and not get caught. Pretty yeah, much. it's it's hard work, mate. It is. It's really hard work. I feel sorry for some of the young lads coming through now because I remember when I was 19, 20 or whatever, we could go out and you'd have a time of your life. You ain't gonna worry about anything, kind of thing. It is what it is. Um, but nowadays, mate, everybody, like even me, I'm I'm 39 years old, I've been retired for what? You've got to be careful months. when you're out. Hey, I go out, don't get me wrong, I ain't trying to do anything dodgy or anything weird, so I'm fine anyway. But I will catch people sneakily videoing me or sneaky taking pictures. Do you know what I mean? And the, the worst thing with like a picture is that it's just that instant moment and yeah. you could be doing anything. Somebody could come and ask you the time, yeah? And if it's a girl or something like that, she's asking you the time, right? It looks, you that can mean anything, but that picture is you with a girl and that's the problem there. So then surely there's got to be, you know, lads, professional footballers in their 20s who want that night out what do they do? Do they just wait and go to Miami at the end of the year? What, like, how do they never yeah, That's why all the footballers in the summer will always just go away because you're not so recognisable out there. You're not like the, you, you know what I mean? It's, you're not in the news all day over there kind of thing. Um, but when, like nowadays, a lot of these like clubs and stuff like that, they'll have VIP areas and stuff like that. And it sounds like a big time thing to do to go in the VIP area. But if you were to go into just a normal nightclub, like, like I say, I'm 39 years old, yeah. I'm not that famous, right? I am not that famous. But even I go to a nightclub or whatever, and it's just carnage. You just people asking for pictures. Yeah, yeah. And then it's not even the people asking for pictures as well. You'll get a lot of these footballers will get the abuse and they'll get like the remarks. And that's when trouble happens. And it's a not like it's, it's hard work for young people to go out nowadays and go to a nightclub. So we always try and just say, listen, go for a meal, like have a nice meal or something like that. Go to a nice bar and that's about it really, but don't go stupid. I heard that uh, Jermaine Pennant had his own club. I think that's... Yeah, that's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. Great passer banter and rapport in that interview. That's fantastic, but not as fantastic 
a Surfshark. I'm serious. So what is Surfshark, guys? Well, if you don't know by now, Surfshark is a VPN, a virtual private network that keeps your online data safe by encrypting all the data between the device and the internet. This is really, really important for several reasons. First of all, this is crucial when using public Wi-Fi as it keeps those pesky cyber criminals at bay. When you're out and about, you want that security and that's what Surfshark provides. But not only that, with a Surfshark VPN, you can change your real location. Why do you want to change your real location? Let me tell you why. Let me finish. Just listen, okay? Because you can change your real location in terms of you being on the internet to any location around the world. Over 3,200 servers in over 100 countries. But what does that allow you to even do, Jim? Well, again, listen to what I'm trying to say to you. It means that you can access new content by exploring the Netflix libraries of Japan, USA, Australia. Also, if you want to do something and you just don't want to be spotted, change that location. That'll sort yourself out as well. And also, if you're on holiday and you're not able to watch your favorite sporting event, or even in this country and you want to use a stream from another country, you can change your IP address back to the UK if you want to watch Match of the Day, BBC iPlayer, Sky Sports, whatever it is, you name it, or vice versa. Masking your IP address it is essential in becoming private online. A VPN ensures your city, country, and download history isn't going to be linked to your identity. Not only that, Surfshark's clean web feature blocks ads, phishing attempts, tracking, and malware, allowing you to surf the web safely and giving you peace of mind. And the final thing that sets Surfshark apart and provides even more value is that you can use your Surfshark's VPN on unlimited devices. Look, if you don't currently have a VPN, it just makes sense to have one to watch what you want, where you want, whenever you want, safely. Take a look at the link in the description. That will take you to the Surfshark website where you can get yourself 83% off and three months extra for free right now by using my code ALLCOT. Surfshark offers a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there is zero risk. So why not give Surfshark a go and get yourself a VPN if you don't have one? It's 2023. You need one. Off you go. Links in the description. There's another one for me. What percentage of players actually care about the fans? Uh, Be honest. Yeah, I don't they think can't I, I don't think it's a care. massive. I don't think it's a massive percentage. I, it's really hard to put a finger on it. I don't think it's a massive percentage because. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of sort of international footballers come over nowadays. A lot of foreign players, and it's it's impossible to expect them to know like the history and the culture of the club and what it means to the fans. It's impossible, right? It's only when you, I think, as players, it's only when you've really grown up in the area or you've been there for a long time that you understand it and you get to see it up close and personal. Um, it's yeah, it's it's really hard though, and it, it's hard to expect them to understand it or to care. Do you know what I mean? When they're coming over and it's life changing money and it's all that kind of stuff, it's it's really hard to do. I'd say it's a small percentage, not in a yeah. not in a bad way. Like they don't want to understand the fans and they don't want to get to know the fans. It's just that when you when you get too close to the fans, you you basically you'll get mobbed. So you know, like players running into the fans and and afterwards trying to go and speak to people. The second one fan sees you, yeah. And he asked for a picture. That fancy, that fancy, and you could be there for hours. Honestly, if you were to do everybody, it'd be hours. Like, and don't worry, I would happily do it, and it's not a problem for me to go and do that. And you, like, even if you're spending half an hour talking to fans and whatever, it's cool. But some players aren't comfortable enough to do that as yeah. well. Yeah, and it's and that can be quite scary, I'd imagine. Also, I was wondering if this, as a footballer in this business of football, you must feel like a bit of a commodity. And fans flip flop so quickly. Yeah. One minute they love you, one minute they hate you, and that's the other thing. Modern football is. You're told. Yeah. When it's not going well. So I would get bitter with that. I would get resentful. Loyalty as well. Loyalty is a big thing in football where fans are always like, oh, you're just, a, you know, we've got relegated, so you jumped ship and all that kind of stuff. But football clubs do that to players all the time. Yeah. All the time. They just get rid of them. They basically say to you, you're not welcome here anymore. We're going to sell you. And like you say, on the, uh, on the flip side of it as well, fans can be so fickle as well. Can be so, so fickle. Like, mm. they love a player one week, he makes a mistake and he's the worst and he's this and he's that. We were just chatting about um, football film. It was, we were talking about David Moyes. Guy was a god, yeah. like six months ago. And um, Liverpool as well. Say that midfield or some of those players, again, quite quickly. It's amazing how quickly it changed. So, oh. so I mean, I was, I was intrigued. Give me a percentage then. Oh, who actually care about the fans? I'd say it's probably... I'd say about 25% I'll go for. I will go back because you've always got those homegrown players or the players that have been at the club long enough to understand what it does mean to the fans. Okay. Uh, Kiwi Mancunian. Uh, who's, so this could be two ways we'll spin it. I mean, go, who's your least favourite referee? Yeah. Or you go, who is the least favourite referee in the Premier League generally? Who? Who do, who's one that 
all the players are love, they're here, it's going to be that ref, and they go, oh. Or is there a player that a ref that you had, you go, oh, no, he, I don't like him, he doesn't like me, whatever it might be. Um, no, do you know what? I was always pretty, um, I, I always found myself pretty savvy with the referees. I think there's, you can be, you can get a referee on, on your side. side a little yeah. bit if you're a little bit personal with them. And do you know what I mean? Even in the, even in the like tunnel before the game, if you can make a little bit of small talk, like I you know used to I mean? be like that. Like, I'd try and go, I'd, I'd try and be mates with them. Mate, try and be mates Especially with Especially I used to play centre midfield, so I'd try and get, I'd try and sort of. Be like I, oh, I understand that was yeah. before this was hard, whatever, and they might hey, just give you that little referee bit. John Moss. Yeah, he loves his cycling, absolutely buzzes off his cycling. I followed him on Instagram because of it, right? And since I followed him about I don't know three years ago, whatever. Any time he was doing our game, whether it was a linesman or as a referee, right, I would have something to talk about with him before the game to say, oh, mate, since you've been out on your bike or this or that or whatever, because <laughs> you've got a bit of common ground sort yeah. of thing. But because of that, we've got a little bit of a relationship. Something, isn't there? Uh, there's something there. And I'm not saying that he's going to sway his decision or whatever, but I think subconsciously you, there's something there for sure, 100%. I don't know. I've never really failed to get on with a referee or had a problem with a referee or thought someone was worth. You do come across some really arrogant referees who... Are, uh, Were there any referees that your clubs... You remember clubs hate, hating having that ref? Um... No, not really. We really didn't. We didn't. We didn't think about stuff like that too yeah. much. So I know, like Alex Ferguson back in the day was massive on certain referees and all that kind of stuff, and they were very careful. The Premier League were about what referee they attributed to different games and all that kind of stuff. But you do, you come. We have come across some referees who have got a bit of arrogance about them. To almost like you go up to say, "Ref, come on, Neil, go, go away, get away from me, get out of my face now." And it's that dismissive bit, you know, that rude. Like, even some referees have been like. Mm. Like, and you're thinking, come on, there's no need for that. Yeah, Do you know yeah, what I mean? yeah. Okay, uh, we'll stick with it a little bit because so, you've played for obviously a uh, big six side and you played for sides outside of that. Uh, Scott asks, uh, do you think there's bias towards the big six in English football on and off the pitch? A I'm little bit. On the pitch. A particular. little bit on the pitch, yeah. I do think a little bit on the pitch. Patrick Vieira said that this, essentially said that this weekend. Yeah, yeah. That, well, Patrick Vieira's been there and seen it and done it. I think if you're going to listen to somebody's word and take it as a bit of a, yeah, probably, then Patrick Vieira is probably that guy. Do you know what I mean? Playing in the Premier League for, what, 10, 15 years, won everything. Um, now a manager, successful manager as well. Um, you should probably listen to it and make, think it probably makes sense, to be honest. I, I agree a little bit as well, to be fair. I just think, um, I just think in... In games for some of the middle teams and smaller teams in the Premier League, when they're playing against a, a big boy, any decision that might might sort of help the big team out will get looked at and it will get analysed a bit more than what it would do if it's a, a West Ham versus Leeds or a Leeds versus Brentford, for example. Do you know what I mean? I just think... Yeah, I just think they will take their time over it a bit more and just try and look for a few more things. Right, this is, this is a bit more serious... But I do want to ask these questions. Um, David Aikerman, are you aware of any teammates uh, being gay but sort of staying in the closet during your career? Obviously not expecting to say any names, don't want to hear any Yeah, names. of course, no. Uh, no, I'm not aware of anyone who is outwardly gay at all whatsoever. But I'm the same as you guys. Like, If you look at the statistics... This, there has to be gay footballers. There has to be gay footballers out there. And I think it's just a shame, really, and it's sad that we're still at that place where players aren't comfortable enough to come out and say, I am gay, for fear of what, one, might go on in the changing rooms and what might get said, and two, what fans might say as well. I think probably, I'd say probably the biggest fear would be the fans' reaction. Because yeah. I could imagine that to be able to come out and be brave enough to say that and then go and play a football match and hear the crowds chanting homophobic chants or something like that would absolutely kill you. And I think that's that's where we still are at the minute. Don't get me wrong, it's got better. Um, you know, the, the, there are footballers that have come out, but it's um, it's very few and far between. But if, like I say, if you look at the statistics, there has to be gay footballers out there. Yeah, but just, you know, so many... So I find um, incredible that there's not... It just sounds the right, like the wrong word, but it's sort of underground scene of understanding that them there has to be players in, with the amount of obviously men in, Simple as that. in those groups. Simple as that. There but, will it, be. but it just never. It just, no, nothing. nothing. I've never. On it, I can honestly say, hand on heart, throughout my whole career, twenty years career, I, there's no. I've never been in a changing room where it's known, it's known that there's a footballer in the team that's gay. There's ne I've never come across that. Okay. Another one. that's a bit more personal to you. Again. Yeah. Up to you to answer it. Uh, Becky asks, do you think that YouTube, the YouTube channel affected your career? 
in the last couple of years? Um, I don't think it affected my career. I think it probably um, it probably helped me to retire a, a year earlier or two than what I would have wanted to do a couple of years. But that's different because I changed though over the time because I always thought I thought I think once I got to thirty seven, thirty eight, I was thinking I could probably go into my forties here, and I'd be happy to have done that. Mm. Um, but then once you get to 38, 39 and stuff just does hurt so much, your body hurts, I promise you, mate, it kills, <laughs> right? But then when I've got a podcast on the side and I've got a YouTube channel and we're doing all sorts of bits and bobs. You're excited about the future? Yeah, I'm excited about the future and I like doing it as well. I really enjoy doing it. So it makes that decision to, I, I, I'm sorry, I, what I'd say is I was probably in a luxurious place or position to be able to go, actually, I don't want to carry on playing football. I don't want to be away from the family all the time and do all the traveling and all that kind of stuff. And I can just live at home and do what we what we've been doing in the media and enjoy it a lot more. So um, I don't think it's affected it because whether whether externally from the club's point of view or whatever, that that's one thing I can't answer for them. Mm. But for me personally, I think I just got very good at just sort of owning it and wearing it. And whilst you were playing and doing the channel at the same time, yeah. Because I, I I don't like so Jesse Lingard does two TikToks dancing and and he's got to focus on his football. Yeah. Like did did you actually find it more as a like a light relief and escape and away uh, away from the pressures of football like or was the balance too much at times was it difficult no it's just I, I enjoy being busy so I just, yeah. enjoy, just enjoy doing stuff do you know what I mean and I think as I've got older I've enjoyed talking about football a bit more and just showing what football is about and stuff um but no, I, 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 we need to get to the way that Americans are. Like Americans embrace this stuff. Like you wouldn't have believe. A life. Like, Honestly, like, having a life. There's, there's a there's an American. Uh, sorry, there's a, a basketball player called uh, Draymond Green. Right, he's got a YouTube channel. Yeah, and in, they were in the NBA Finals last year. And after every game, right, he was going on YouTube live, live streaming, right, and he was breaking down the game for you. Yeah, that is the way that media should be. Right, where. It's not like a stiff reporter going, what happened in this quarter? And you've got to play the game and you've got to speak politely and eloquently and you've got to play by the rules. Mm. When you've got your own YouTube channel, you've got your own platform, you can say what you want to say when you want to say it, right? So you can go in all, into all those tiny little details. It'll do it for like an hour or whatever. Was, I'm talking straight after the game. Yeah. So like emotion is still high. Like if, if he's won, it's buzzing. If he's lost, he's sad, he's down, but he's breaking it down for you. Don't get me wrong. It's, it's the same sort of thing, though. You'd have people that if he's lost the game saying, what are you doing this for? You've just lost the game. You should be focusing on the game. But if he wins, it's like, oh, I love this. He's won. He's happy. He should be doing this. I find that so redundant, that that point as well, because f- focus is, you've got to be careful with focus. Yeah. You can be over-focused. For you know, sure, Too mate. much. And then, then that, look, that will I hurt. totally agree. I totally agree. As well. It's like if any, you know, like football matches when you say, like if you're playing like a derby game or a cup final or something like that, that, that people are like, should be extra focused for this one. I mean, no, yeah. definitely not. You yeah. should do nothing different for this game than what you do for every other single game. It doesn't matter if you're playing bottom of the league, it's a cup tie, away at wherever, it doesn't matter. Every game should be addressed and focused on exactly the same amount and that's it. Okay. Right, some quick fire ones for you, just to finish it up. So with that, with the media and all that. These you, are a doddle, these questions. Are, I'm like, okay. I was expecting you to be asking some filthy ones, like <laughs> filthy ones. Like. How many players, are, name five players on drugs. No. Um, <laughs> do, <laughs> do most players hate the media and pundits? Uh, yes. Most players hate doing the media and pundits because one, a lot of footballers aren't comfortable enough talking uh, and doing interviews, all that kind of stuff, just because they know that the that the that the media basically is out to trip them up a little bit. So they'll ask questions that if you're not intelligent enough to answer it in a certain way, it can get misconstrued sure. or something. And that's the problem. They're all, they're always a little bit worried about. It. This is why they need to have their own YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. Say it in your own words. Your own do you know I mean say it in your own terms yeah. on in your own words? But yeah, they do. And a lot of players will also look and watch Sky Sports News and they'll listen to the big pundits and they'll. They don't basically footballers don't like ex players ripping into somebody and saying he's a disgrace or he's this or he's that because it's not the done thing, Mm. but it's the way of the world nowadays. They people have to be outspoken. Some platforms are worse than others, some channels are worse than others, but it's the way of the world. Skibby, if you could knock one player you've played uh, against out, who would it be? Oh, wow, what a question this is! If I could knock one, (laughs) I was gonna leave that one out, (laughs) played with or against. Uh, but you've played against, I guess. Who's, a, who's, a, who's someone who's like, you may have lost your head with? Is there anyone who's got you? Nah, mate. I'm a lover, yeah. mate. I ain't a fighter. Come but no, on. Well, but no, I guess no one's gone after you then. No one's sort of... You've not got those, Surely there's those chirpy players. I guess you played with Troy Deeney, didn't you? Oh, mate. <laughs> I ain't trying to knock Troy Deeney out, mate. You better... No, no, no. But Troy Deeney's got the chat. He's got good chat. 
Yeah, yeah but were, even then, though, I, in, I, I just think I got to a point where I understood it for what it was, so it didn't really affect right. me too much. But I can't, I can't go knocking somebody no, out. Just, it's not my these, game. That's what I'm saying. These are the difficult Who questions. Who asked this question? That's Skibby. I'm shaming you, Skibby. Skibby. Let me know. Like, I want to know in the comments down below who... Who players, who fans would most like to knock out? <laughs> Which like. player currently playing in the Premier League would you most like to knock out? I'm not saying anybody. I don't like say I'm a, I'm, I'm a yeah. lover, mate. And we don't want anyone knocking anyone out, especially hypothetically. Yeah, hypothetically yeah. We're talking cool. hypothetically. Okay. Well, all right. Here's a twist on it. Uh, so Bashir says, which players are the most unpopular within the Premier League within football? Are there some unpopular players there? Got to be. Nah. No. Nah. Like, yeah. again, Robbie Savage, you were playing with him. No, nah, do you know, problem. like, yeah, so, do you know the sort of players that are um, that are kind of imp- unpopular in football and, and, and only in your team and stuff is, like, the busy players. Do you know, like, the, you know the Peter Crouch podcast, yeah, mm. where he talks about parched? Somebody who is, like, <laughs> like, they're... A, bear, they're, a bit of a beg. They're bit beg, too. they're beggy, they're busybodies. They're, like, they're warm up in front of, like, the manager when the game's on and stuff like that to be, like, look at me, look at me, put me on the pitch. Right, all the time. They're the kind of, yeah, teacher's pets. The players who are a bit like that, they're, they're even then, though, they're not unpopular. They're not, they, it's not like there's ever going to be a segregation or anything like that, but they're the ones that will get the mick taken out of them for being beggy. Okay. Uh, Ali uh, on Twitter said, uh, when you were on the bench, did you ever secretly hope the team would concede a few? your chances of starting place. No, that's Surely. horrible. That's all the invention. time. All the time I'd do that, for sure. Like, get me on the pitch. You seen, I'm sitting next to the manager going, you seen that? Did you see? What, how bad is that? He didn't even move, mate. He didn't even move. Nah, that's, that's not amazing. me, mate. That's no. not me. Um, to be fair, like, the only times I've been on the bench in my career was when I was at Man United, when I was, a ki- when I was younger. Um, and probably deep down, I didn't even want to come on because the pressure and expectation of coming on and replacing then Edwin van der Sar, van der Sar was like, whoa, yeah. this is big deal. Mm. Like, this is a problem. I would have been nervous as heck, yeah? Um, but then also towards the end of my career, when I, I went through a period at Watford in the Championship when I was on the bench and started the Premier League season when I was on the bench, um, I... I basically saw it as my responsibility to get behind the goalie because he's a younger goalie in his right. mid-20s and help him as much as I can and also to help the team as well. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm that... If I'm not on the pitch playing, it, you have to take up a different job role and you have to help as much as you can. Maybe goalkeeper feels a bit... They all seem to stick together. Yeah, we do. Exactly more. that. Yeah, I would, I'd hate to think that I've ever played with somebody and a sub-goalie and he's sitting on the bench thinking, oh, I'd, I want him to mess up so I can get... I'd hate to think it would be like that because most goalies aren't like that at all. Lul Susif, I can't even say his name. Uh, my question is, when a coach uh, you're under gets the sack, how do you and the uh, squad react to it? Is there a WhatsApp group and is it firing off? Do you talk about it in the dressing room when someone's gone? Um, how does yeah, it work? Uh, back in the day, it would have been on the WhatsApp group, but the WhatsApp groups aren't a thing anymore because WhatsApp group have, have basically stopped because it's, it's, there's so much of a worry yeah, of stuff getting leaked. Because if somebody, all it takes is somebody to not have a passcode on their phone. If they lose their phone, right, somebody's got access to that whole WhatsApp group chat, yeah? And stuff can get said in there that you wouldn't want the outer world to know about, right? It's like, you, I guarantee you've got group chats where you do not want the world to see that, right? It's the same with footballers' group chats. So they're not even really a thing too much anymore. Um, when a manager gets sacked, though, it is, you'll, you'll hear about it on the news with everybody else. You, never, you don't hear before, for sure. You do not hear before. You will hear the same as everybody else. Um, and then it's a case of you turn in in the morning, you're in the changing rooms, and everybody will just sort of hang around the changing rooms to chat to each other and be like, oh, God, yeah, uh, have you heard who's coming in? Have you heard who's coming in? It's always normally about the rumour mill about who's going to be coming in next kind of thing, and then trying to find out what that manager's like. Have you played in the room before? What's he like? Is he a good guy? What days off does he give you? (laughs) Yeah, days off is currency, mate. That's what you want to know, all right? Okay, last one. Uh, John Dewhurst. Uh, Have you ever been in a dressing room where the manager lost the dressing room and in that, that situation do players actually down tools is that an actual thing um it, it is an actual thing it's an actual thing and it's not um it's not it's not it is it is intentional and they're doing it kind of on purpose but it's a i think it's a human subconscious level thing as well where they they just won't quite stretch that much further or five percent it's not even that i promise you it might even be one percent two percent but that one percent two percent is the difference between being on your a game and doing everything properly and being nowhere near it that's how that's how like the how detailed it is nowadays if you're not fully on your game 
you ain't playing, you shouldn't be playing, right? And when 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 managers and you, I think what it comes down to is your personal relationship with that manager. And if you don't respect that manager, yeah, that's what it comes down to. Because people are human beings, footballers are human beings, sorry, and they have feelings. And if they get them hurt, yeah, footballers are like an ego, egotistical bunch anyway. So if you hurt an egotistical footballer, phew, you'll know about it. Seal down tools, like. Mm. Has so, you been in? Is there a moment where you've gone? Oh. We've gone. Do you know what? I've been in a. I've been, I remember back at West Brom back in the day, right? And it wasn't down in tools, right? But we had um, we, our manager got sacked. I think it was Alan Irvine got sacked, and we got um, we got a Spanish manager called Pepe Malin, right? Pepe Mal came over, and he's he, straight away. West Brom had built their whole like past history basically on having sort of like a British manager, yeah. a British manager that would play. Sensible football, but not too sort of like tiki tacky. Exactly, yeah. they keep it simple. It is what it is. You know what you're getting with it, right? And then all of a sudden, we're struggling. The manager's been sacked, Alan Irvine. We're struggling, and then this Spanish manager comes in, and straight away, he's, his English is super limited. I mean, crazy limited. But the gist of it was, I want you to start playing out from the back. Yeah, I, me and goal. Craig Dawson at right back. Gareth McCauley, Jonas Olsen, Liam Ridgewell. Yeah, that's the back four. We ain't trying to play out from the back, yeah? That ain't even a thing, right? That is not even a thing. So he comes in on the Monday and straight away on the training pitch, it's right, let's start with the goal kick, yeah? Let's start with the goal kick, right? Ridgewell, Dawson, stretch the pitch out. You get on the lines. Defenders pull out a little bit, yeah? Midfielder might drop and look for it. I'd play it and we'd go from there and we'd pass, 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 pass. The other team has to just press us, try and stop us from doing it. Couldn't get out. Yeah. Could not get out once, right? Could not because it's not our game. It's not our forte. We've literally played the last however many years. Get over that pitch and win that header. Yeah. That's as simple as that, right? So he did this, and we 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 you you've got to get on board with the manager, and you've got to try and do it, and you've got to support it. And our uh, me as a senior player, and the other senior players have to get everybody else on board and go. Come on, lads, this is what it is. You've got to do it. Buy into it. Buy into it. But very quickly after a few weeks, it was literally like, nah, this can't work. This is not going to work. We are killing ourselves doing this, right? Losing games. So eventually we had to we had to basically go and say to him, because the assist, he only came in by himself, just his manager. That was it. It was just Pepe Mal by himself, right? Lovely bloke, by the way. Genuinely a lovely, lovely man. Um, but we had the, still had the same assistant manager, Keith Downing, who's a legend. Dean Kiley, the goalie coach, legend. No football like the back of their hands, right? Mm. We had to go to the manager and we had to go to Keith and we had to go to Dean and say, listen, this isn't working. We cannot do this anymore, right? Pepe Mal has, he, he built his career on being a, a, a ball playing manager, yeah? This is probably the only way he knows. So at this point we have to say, right, Keith, you are going to have to take training. You are gonna have to revert to doing it the way that we know best, yeah? So he would basically jump and be a joint manager with Pepe Mal. Pepe Mal would be the face of it. Keith Downing would take the training session wow. and instruct everything. Pepe Mal, to be fair to him, honestly, to be fair to him, went, I get that. Accepted I understand it. that. It's not working the way that I'm doing it, yeah? Keith Downing knows how to get you playing football better, so let's just do that. And everyone went, love that. Absolutely buzz off that, right? <laughs> but then you have respect for the manager for that, okay? Yeah. You have respect for I'm the manager good. for it, right? We ended up winning a load of games towards the end of the season, managed to stave off relegation. Like It was an absolute miracle, seriously, right? But that is one of the only times where I've seen it where we've had to actually go, we can't do that. We're not going to play that style of football. So, Sorry, final question, because it just popped into my head. With everything we've talk, spoken about, and often you know players come out and you know they're lying, can you give me an example when you've lied in an interview? <laughs> you must have. Um... You um, must tell all the time, all the time. I can't, I can't think of an individual one, but you're always, everybody lies. Like if you're losing, yeah? If you're losing week in, week out, and you're in the relegation zone, and you're struggling, confidence is low, all that kind of stuff, yeah? You will say the same shit every single time, James, right? Nah, the, the lads are fighting hard, like we're sticking together, we've got team spirit, yeah? We've got all that kind of stuff, we're doing the right things, we're working hard in training. Load of shit. Like it isn't like confidence is rock bottom. Because last year I felt like they wheeled you out a lot. You seem to have to do yeah. a lot more. I was the four guy. Cluster, right? I'm yeah. the four guy, mate, and I'll take it because I was like, you know, I don't care. I'm 39 years old. It is what it is, and I'll tell you. But honestly, like if we just, we, I remember getting beat by Man City eight 0 and coming out and them going, 
wow, what a day. And I was going, Phew, they're incredible. Like, they're incredible. And I remember saying it, and it went out on match of the day, and I went, they're incredible. And every single Watford fan went, oh, they're incredible, are they? Ben, Fo well, it's as simple as that. It's incredible, is it? I'm thinking, well, yeah, they are, because they're incredible. They're Man City. Like, you know what I mean? Oh, don't get me wrong, I love Watford as a football club, and I, I get it. I get what the fans are going through. It's an emotional attachment. But you've got to be realistic as well. Yeah. They are incredible. Mm -hmm. They're just better than us in every department. They get paid more money because they are faster and fitter and stronger and better at football. They can deal with stuff better than we can. It's not rocket science. But yeah, everybody that's just lost the game will come out and say, especially if you're in the in the in the bottom of the league, you they will come out and say those kind of those normal things. But it's yeah, because guaranteed there's there's people in that change of rooms who are causing an absolute riot and they're nightmares to deal with and players don't like each other and you have little fractions and stuff like that because it's like any workplace there's yeah. people that you like and there's people that you don't like but you've got to sort of just put a brave face on it amazing you are incredible mate cheers you thank incredible. you no you're really good. So good you did football filming with us earlier and you were incredible mate honestly this is like um, it's like a loving right now but this I like good. it it was right. good mate everybody else, uh, go check out Ben Foster's channel uh, if you enjoyed it hit the like button subscribe and who do you want to knock out let us know in the comments um, down below quickly how much is this top Corinthians by the way Oh, lovely gorgeous lovely